Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the important role of summer programs for children in need with special guests. Aaron Dvorkin, CEO of the National Summer Learning Association in Washington, D.C. Glenda Bernhardt, CEO of Freedom School Partners in North Carolina. And Randy Barr, founder and CEO of thinktogether.org in California. Thank you all for joining us. It's just wonderful to see you. I'm going to uh, set you up and we're going to go uh, over to you, Aaron, um, uh, uh, toward, the, toward the end of this setup. So um, summer programs always been so very important to helping children and families in need. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I went to the, uh, to the Y before the Y became uh, so known as being a health club. It was really an organization that served um, uh, uh, people at the lower income strata. And that's where I learned to, sw- to swim. Um, and uh, let's start our discussion with, with this idea of the summer as a learning opportunity and, and the whole topic of summer learning loss, which for lower income kids uh, can be a real, real issue as their parents um, uh, struggle with their, their jobs and trying to provide an enriched environment. There's no school support. Uh, during that time. So could you talk about uh, describing this idea, Aaron? Um, and you are, you're, you're on mute, so you'll have to uh, unmute yourself. Uh, could you describe this idea of summer learning loss and also the whole idea of providing a supportive environment when school is not in session? Sure. And hi, everybody watching. And thank you, Mark. And great to be with Glenda and, and Randy as well. So uh, I'll just quickly say, you know, I'm the CEO of a group called the National Summer Learning Association. It's a mouthful, NSLA, we refer to ourselves. Been around for 30 years. Started with some uh, pretty br- groundbreaking longitudinal research done out of Johns Hopkins University, uh, you know, following thousands of children, low-income children, especially over years, and, and seeing that the big difference maker in their lives uh, was that over the summers, Middle and upper middle class families get to continue learning in, in one way or another and all these different opportunities. And then low income kids don't have those opportunities and they fall behind and that those effects were cumulative. So over a few years, it wasn't you could be a few years behind your peers. That's what summer learning law. You're going like this. Right. So, you, you know, you're you're learning. Right. And then summer happens and then you have this fall off and then you, right. you learn and then you have fall. Off. But over time that gap uh, is cumulative, right? For, exactly. For and so that, that, it was very academic focused. What, what I will just take a step back is you, you can't have a discussion about summer learning loss without connecting it to now what we're experiencing with COVID learning loss. And, and, and by the way, it, other people like different terms, unfinished learning. I mean, they're, they're, this has been going on for decades. I would argue that summer learning It's just a metaphor. And when people talk about summer and and what needs to happen, especially for low-income kids, we're really just talking about uh, fighting inequality in education. Summer is the most unequal time in all of education for the reasons I just described. It's also uh, a time of great opportunity. And, you know, if Randy, especially, you know, if you work in the out-of-school time world, it's not only negative things can happen, amazing things can happen because you could do you could be so entrepreneurial and, and, and innovative in so many ways, which we can talk about. And then something else that doesn't always get as much attention as it deserves is that all these great summer programs, uh, and I come out of the out-of-school time world for, for, for decades now, but specifically summer programs have a big focus on building community. And there's no program, whether it's a STEM program, a sports program, a reading program, whatever, the summer youth employment program, that is successful without building a sense of community and camaraderie and mentoring and all these things. And that in our country right now, when we're so divided, is more important than ever. All these negativity, all these inequities are being seen on display from COVID. And so there's a big focus on it right now. Socialization, communication skills, play skills, the whole idea of, of out of the box kind of experiences. Glenda, are you, uh, how, how do you see this, this whole opportunity here? Because I think Aaron is making a really good point. It's not just about uh, maintaining. It's also about jumping into a new paradigm during the summer so that uh, kids can have a, a different type of experience than a classroom experience, which, which has to be structured because you have, you have so many uh, kids to, to help. Uh, Glenda, how, how do you see this? 
I see this as a wonderful opportunity. We like to say here and around the country, there is no school like Freedom School. And that really aligns with what Aaron just shared, because of course we're focusing on literacy and learning. Um, but going back to the comment about COVID, you know, there's also a, a really intentional and intensified focus on social emotional learning now. Um, and the realization that our children are suffering and have suffered and are dealing with things that are connected to their academic achievement and development, but also to their social emotional development and growth there is equally, if not more important. So these things you just said, community, camaraderie, um, these are things we get to do in summer and we get to have fun while we do it. So it really is a tremendous opportunity. The learning is happening and it looks different. It's engaging. We have that flexibility. Uh, we can intentionally incorporate enrichment. And I think all of that is critical to our children's futures. Fun, what a concept. You know, it's, it, what I find to be so interesting was, is when I talk with people, particularly in the academy, so higher education, I talk about edutainment, right? The whole idea that that great knowledge can also be conveyed in a way that is engaging and, edu and, and entertaining and fun. People look at me with often, not always, with, with little frowny faces, right? Randy, do you think fun is part of this, this whole thing? Are you just sort of making it a, a, just a great experience? Yeah, well, learning at its best is fun. So I think um, there's essentially kind of fun with a purpose. Fun is engaging. If you're having fun, you're engaged. So they, they, you know, some of these terms that we throw around, they're, they're Venn diagram, they're, you know, they overlay uh, each other. So we think about sort of the integration of learning, fun, new experiences, that's fun, uh, field trips, um, you know, different friend groups, um, sometimes on a different campus, different location. Those are all new experiences, broadening experiences, and, and they're fun. You know, um, we, can, we can sit there and we can read Shakespeare. We can look at this new film that is uh, that that has uh, been produced with Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand on on Macbeth, and we can absorb, and then we can we can go back and forth. You know that it's it's just such an example of of great literature and great fun, right? This whole idea of of looking at this black and white, um, you know, sort of um, brutalist um, uh, creation. Uh, that that was presented. How do we create experiences, Aaron, that are that have that sort of mix of of real useful knowledge of of skills that we're transmitting? But Randy's point about you know that's the thing, right? It, it, it's the snap, crackle, and pop in learning. It's the thing that creates the magnetic attraction to to lifelong learning. Sure, and I, so I have to emphasize. First of all, we know how to do this well. Our field knows how to do it. We have lots of examples, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. But I do want to just take a, a, a second to even kind of give a little context of why we even use the term summer learning, because it's to your point, Mark, it's in, it was created to make a distinction between summer school, traditional summer school in America, which we should, we should remind ourselves was considered a punishment, punitive. <laughs> if, you know, if you failed, you had to go. It was mandatory. It was academic only. It was, uh, it was in the classroom the or worse. <laughs> it, was, it was like nobody wanted to go. It was not engaging. It was not fun, right? So summer, so we can't, so if you say summer learning, people are like summer school, you're like, no, 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 no. This could be uh, for anybody. By the way, it should be so engaging. You can make it voluntary if people want to come. It's not a punishment. It should be a, like a thrill and exciting because you're going to do all these hands-on projects. It doesn't even have to take place in the school building. The best models, and we give out national awards that thousands of people apply for every year. You know, the museum is running programs with science teachers and the zoo and the aquarium and, you know, and then summer youth employment. So summer learning and how you learn in a fun, creative, hands-on way that then is lasting because you can then become an adult and reach our levels of career and say, you know what? I do this because one summer I had this crazy job or I was in this crazy program. There are all these programs to teach low income, especially kids of color, how to be doctors that, you know, to all over the country. And we are, have a little learning community where we bring them together. I mean, I don't even NIH is running a program for high school kids. FDA is running a program. Every medical school and hospital turned out is running a summer program. They wouldn't, by the way, run other programs for young people during the year, but somehow they're in the summer learning field. So there's a chance in the summer where more people and more stakeholders and unlikely partners are doing good work with kids that you would never even imagine. 
and you're opening doors. You know, we're, we're doing a, a poll right now. I, I'm, I'm watching it tick up as people are answering the question. It's so fascinating. We asked um, in your own childhood, was summer learning a time, uh, a, a, a time for a break for, uh, from learning new things or a time to learn new things, right? This whole idea of fun versus not fun that you're, that you're making, uh, Aaron. And it's about 50-50. You know, it's really interesting how, how um, you know, depending on your childhood, for us, my experience of, of summer school was exactly what you described. You were punished. You went there because you didn't do it. You did do something. You sat in at the time when you should be out and enjoying yourself in, in something that was boring very often with, with a teacher who didn't necessarily, um, uh, um, wasn't necessarily interested in being there and didn't necessarily know the topic. Uh, Glenda? Uh, how, how do you see this this uh, this point that that Aaron is making, and what is the new version of this summer idea of learning that is not like what 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 I experienced when I was a kid? I think Aaron just made a really great point that that version of it is multifold. It looks very different. It might be topic specific, uh, and it might be geographically specific. Um, one thing we know, we just kind of pointed to it is attendance matters. So our programs have to be engaging and fun because if the children aren't with us in the classroom, outside, whatever we're defining as the classroom, the quality of our work doesn't matter. If they're not there to receive it and to interact with it, then it doesn't matter. So that's always our goal uh, every summer. And I'm sure Randy would say the same thing as would everyone who's part of this network that Aaron referenced. You know, our goal is that this is, we're creating a space where every child wants to be where they have the opportunity, they're grateful for the opportunity, and they show up ready to learn and engage because we're offering them something that's exciting that they want to experience. What's different between uh, programs that you might offer, Glenda, and, and, par- and, and we're going we're gonna to go to Randy next, but talk about your programs in North Carolina that might be different than what Randy's offering uh, in California. So we offer a freedom school program here in Charlotte and we do it at multiple sites. So we're connected with the Children's Defense Fund nationally as it relates to the curriculum. But what we offer is literacy and enrichment focused. Uh, It's culturally responsive and that's critical. Our children are having access to books and topics and activities that they likely aren't getting in their school year classrooms. Uh, These are reflective of their culture and history and community. And that's new and exciting uh, and interesting. And also it's, it's important to say our program is at no cost to families. That's, that's what we're doing. And that's what many of us are, are doing in this space to create that access and create the opportunity for families to engage. Randy, you want to you wanna weigh in about what you're doing that, are, that might be specific to California and, and, and how you go about it? Yeah, California is unique. First of all, it's a big place. Um, you know, 12, 14% of, of of all the kids in the U.S. live in California, and certain, we have a third of the kids in California live in poverty. So we've got the biggest <laughs> challenge, the biggest opportunity uh, here. Um, and we also have the most money. The state uh, has led the way for many years uh, with something called the After School Education and Safety Act, which is also uh, as summer programs because of our population, we get the largest allocation of the federal dollars. But last year, um, Governor Newsom and the state legislature created a new pot of funding, the Expanded Learning Opportunity Program, where they put in, uh, so we had about 800 million in, in the pot before. They added 1.7 billion this year. And in the January budget that the governor just announced, they're taking that new pot to 4.4 billion. And the idea is nine hours a day of kind of school and expanded learning, and then 210 days a year. So 180 school days and 30 days summer and kind of spring break. So uh, what we think about, and that's a prelude to the way we think about, we think about what can you do at scale? So there's some, through the National Summer Learning Association, we saw some incredible programs, and Aaron described some of those, that are one-offs. Um, and we want, you know, there's this giant equity gap. How do we create access for all kids? And so we're thinking about that. So we, we operate hundred sites. We're at about 600 schools, about a third of them run summer in the past. We're going to blow through that and, and triple and quadruple and whatever. So we do a combination of, um, because we're partnering with schools, we're on school campuses and we have programs where, where it's like regular summer schools in the morning and we run 
after school and summer. We've got some, the preferred models more integrated throughout the day, and there's some that are completely outsourced to us. But we do a blend, uh, as Glenda talked about, of academic support as well as kind of this enrichment, but tying it together in themes. So we'll, each summer we'll have a theme. It could be a Star Wars theme, or this theme or that theme that are, is relevant to kids, tied oftentimes to popular culture. Uh, we tie in field trips and things like that. So when you're learning, you're tying it to something that's relevant and fun in their world, but you're embedding academic uh, throughout that. But a lot of team building, a lot of the uh, social emotional, even as on a school campus, we make it feel more like summer camp in the woods, even for urban kids that maybe can't get away, but it's teams and themes and shirts and outfits and cheers and you know all of that kind of stuff but embedded uh, with learning. It's happy stuff, it's fun stuff, and it's also learning. Steve Hageman um, uh, made a comment, fantastic. Uh, summer learning was about new things uh, for him, uh, but it was because of the privilege I was afforded to be free to play, to learn relationship skills, to learn self-regulation, to travel with me and my family. Uh, that was so important. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, Randy, first, first you, then Aaron, and then Glenda, could you talk a little bit about this balance between what is traditional um, in terms of cognitive skills, and then the other areas, and that could be in you know in the in the social emotional, it could be in the spiritual uh, world, it could be uh, physical uh, play, learning new skills. Um, how do you balance that? How do you create a a good sweet spot for people for people so that different kids with different needs can come together yet find their needs fulfilled? Well. Um... Some of those starts with staff. I mean, so we hire from the community. So the our students, and increasingly, some, something literally now, our staff were our kids. <laughs> so we've been around a while now. So kids have come up through the program. So it so there's an there's a inclusivity. So they have an eye out for the kids at the fringe who aren't being included. So there's a deliberate outreach to essentially marginalized and the, and the most vulnerable kids to make them you know feel included. So that's kind of attitudinally, it's kind of who we are kind of at the core. And then there's obviously program designs where, you know, when we do sports, we do things where it's skill building, as opposed to where you've got the people that are always the stars are on the field and the other kids are on the bench. But we're doing things where you're practicing skills and we're not just competing and playing the games where you have those divides. And you have the same thing in academics. You have the same thing all through your life. We all, you know, wind up competing and there's kids that get included and the kids are marginalized. So we have this kind of inclusive strategies from the get-go that, that help build that in. And then you're building relationships. You're also mixing it up because, you know, one of the things that we find, we have a school consulting arm that does school improvement work. And people say they don't do it, but kids get tracked. And so by first or second grade, kids are in the, they're in the remedial classes or they're in the, honor, you know, the honors classes or the gifted classes and those kinds of things. And then what happens is those become their friend groups. And then, and those are the, the expectations of teachers. Think So we try to mix it up. So you meet different kids. You have different role models that are your peers. Uh, and that creates a completely different dynamic. So we had a very interesting question. We just said, for those children in need whose parents can't afford it, should American society fund an enriched summer learning program? And we got 100% was yes. But, but we had a real fall off in response. So I suspect that it isn't 100% saying yes. I suspect that people who agreed that we should all fund responded and people who do not believe that we should all fund didn't respond. Um, can we talk a little bit about Randy's point, Aaron, in terms of what California is doing to invest in kids? And, and do we in the United States have a responsibility uh, to invest in kids who are not our own? Uh, because it really is one of those those questions of 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 how do you how do we function as a society? What is our responsibility to Americans who are not me and my family? What are, what is that? Sure, and you know Robert Putnam wrote you know similar similar theme book. You know that you know we got to focus on all our kids. That's only when America will be good when you're not just looking at your children, but you think of all children as our children. But I, so the answer is yes. But I think what the moment is, as we sit here in January 2022, is that we have actually moved past this debate for the moment. It's not a philosophical educational debate like should we invest in all kids, especially low income kids or not, because COVID has created such a crisis that the answer is not only yes, but that we have done it. 
the American Rescue Plan, the $1.9 trillion, you know, has $120 billion for education, $30 billion, which can be used and spent on after school and summer programs right now through 2024. So it's like, take yes for an answer. We're not, we don't need to go. Now we have to prove and scale and do all the things that Glenda and Randy are doing and serve more kids. It's not, it, normally for the past 30 years, I, I jokingly, and I'm going to be so facetious, but my organization wrote like the same op-ed every week. Like summer is the most unequal time and it's unfair and more low-income kids deserve more support and resources. And everyone's like, yeah, okay. But so now that I would, for the moment that has been settled, you know when it won't be settled? If we don't do a good job spending this money and stewarding this money and actually serving more kids in a, in a right. way. And then in three years, it's, they're going to come up and say, all right, we spent all this money. What do you all have to show for it? And then we're going to be back to your debate question of, oh, should we invest in kids or not? Well, last time we put in all this money, nothing, you know, moved the needle. And that is what I am like staying up night, day in, day night out, because I have got to get all the partners who are working with kids to do more and do better by kids and families with this money, or they, they won't, you know, forget having this debate again in three years. You're making such an important point. So yes is the easy answer. Yes, we ought to invest, but investment cannot be infinite. Investment is constrained by capability, and we have other things to invest in as well in, in this society. So the quality is so important. Accountability is so important. Glenda, how do you assure accountability? When you hire somebody for, to be a teacher, it's, it's famously difficult to create accountability because kids are all different and you can't just create one standard. How do, you, how do you assure that money that is rooted through freedom schools is really well spent? How do you hold yourself accountable? How does your board hold, your, hold, hold you accountable? Well, quality and data are essential to our ability uh, to, to have continued investment in our work. So certainly uh, we are a 22-year-old organization, so we're very young in the life cycle as well. Um, but we have a rigorous process, and we're lucky enough, just like Randy, that we have our former scholars at this point who are applying to be our servant leader interns. We have an intergenerational model. It's college students that are classroom facilitators, and it's college students who look like and have experiences like our scholars. Because again, that's critical. They need to see themselves and the people that are in front of their rooms. And part of our work is related to the pipeline for teachers of color uh, and, and that issue in our, in our country. Um, but we have third-party evaluation. We're measuring how, how the academic skills piece is going and also how that social emotional skills piece is going, what it feels like, how parents are engaging, what, what the staff experience is. All of these things are important and are part of how we collectively meet this moment that Aaron just defined. Um, how will we do it creatively? How will we do it in partnership with other organizations and school districts around this country? I'm jealous of what Randy shared about California. This looks very different state by state with how this money is coming down, how it's coming through, how it's being allocated. Um, and that's all really critical to what this looks like in three years. The other thing that strikes me is that if you look at uh, North Carolina and some of the laws that have been passed uh, to uh, basically um, uh, suggest that, that uh, things like critical race theory are being taught to really young kids and to prevent that, that teaching and, and those kinds of, kinds of things, it seems that one of the things that you're doing as a, as a locally empowered uh, group is you're basically saying, you know, actually, um, we're going to take our role informed by the sensibility of, of kids and their parents. And so you're taking a distinctive path that is not in conformity to what's going on at University of North Carolina or what's going on at, you know, at the state level or even at the school board level. You're taking a path that really is, is just about the dialogue between uh, kids and their parents and yourself. Um, Randy, Aaron, could you weigh in on this whole idea of, of, of government standards, which there is a place for, right? Accreditation and so on and so forth, but also local, local, local. And, and Randy, you're, you're in a great position because California is so different depending on where you are locationally. Yes. So I actually believe in standards. Um, you know, really what standards are demystified. It's just the goal. What do you want your goals to be at the end of the year? What do you want kids to know at the end of the year? And uh, what back and back map that. Uh, and so what happens is 
what we see, and, and we're, we're in 600 schools, we have a school consulting arm that's, that's very data-driven, essentially Moneyball for schools. And what we see is in, okay. in, 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 in more affluent communities, you have higher expectations. And even, even within schools, you have like the honors kids, there's a different set of expectations. And, and kids rise to the expectations. So what you need is to have high expectations for kids. And then you need the equity part is you need to give them the support that they need. So whether it's the tutoring, the summer program, the expanded learning, that all of the support so they can meet those high standards. But what I don't like about the localization and, and, and broad sets of freedom, it dumbs it down. And that's where discrimination lives is discrimination lives in lower standards uh, and, and that and lower expectations. Sometimes it's not, it's not deliberate like we hate kids of color and that it's, it's oftentimes out of a soft heart that like, well, we can't possibly hold these kids to those expectations because they don't have this, that or the other thing. It's like, no, the, if you love them, the best thing you can do is have high expectations and then give, provide them the supports they need to achieve that. That's what we do as parents. Um, and you have to do that as a society at scale. So the idea here is that and we're going, we're coming to the end of our time. So we're going to go to Aaron and then we're going to, uh, Glenda, you're going to have the last word. So your point is that we should have standards. Those standards should be high standards, but how you implement those standards uh, yeah. locally. Local context. There you're talking about, you know, let's let's be a little modular. Let's, let's be adaptable in terms of the local delivery. Aaron, you want to comment on this whole idea? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm, so I'm in D.C., so I'm in the middle of like at the federal level stuff and we're, we're removed. You know, people talk about kids. They don't know any kids. They can't name a kid. They, you know, they care about ephemeral children. But like Randy and Glenda see actual children every day. So so we have just this fragmented education system and it, it, it hurts us in many ways because you can't collect national data correctly. No one could actually say how many young low income young people were in summer programs last summer across the country. Libraries are collecting what they're collecting. The school districts got theirs. The Boys and Girls Clubs got their info, the jobs, you know. So we are trying. So there's a late leadership and coordination. A lot of this is at the local level, I would say. And I just want to really quickly, I know we're wrapping up, but I just want to highlight the opportunity, though, that's really at the ground for all of us and why we should invest in this, which is I just refer quickly to the like the four eyes. And that summer specifically is like this time for improvement, not just for young people, but for the staff. So they were both talking about their staff. And it's every summer program doubles up a staff training. So if you really want to get ready for the school year, do a good job in your summer program. Also, the second eye is for innovation. And we do need to innovate. And we can't just do things the way it was 100 years ago. And people and a lot of great programs, schools, nonprofits even start out as some Kip charter schools start out as a six week summer program. And then intersectionality, this idea of getting you get government and nonprofit and businesses all to work together. Everyone wants to work together, but once the school year starts, no one has time. The summer is the one real time when people could plan together and actually practice partnerships. And if they work, they carry over. And the last eye is about impact. Randy, Glenda are doing it every day when real people, real kids' lives. I would also just say that summer is this, by definition, a life transition point. And it's the summer between middle school and high school and high school and college and elementary and middle school. And if you think people are paying attention, that's the time they're paying attention to whatever you're going to share with them, because their life is kind of like their life direction is kind of up for grabs. And if you do a really intensive, proper summer program, you could really shape the direction. And that's real impact. folks. And I love your point about how we can't track uh, what kids are doing in school and we can't respond to it via data. When if I look at a if I look at a an article on toasters, I get served a million advertisements on toasters. All of a sudden, people are tracking my my toaster interests, but they're not uh, tracking whether kids are getting educated. We need to we need to shift that, don't we, Glenda? We definitely do. And um, and what a wonderful conversation about this because there is so much opportunity to meet this moment and hopefully to embrace all children as our children and have high standards for them because they're excellent. And it's our job to help them achieve that excellence. I just want to thank you all so much. I, I think that, that if, if, I, if I were to make a takeaway uh, here, it's that it's that these are really serious conversations. We have a limited amount of resource in this country. We have to invest them, invest it, not all in any one thing, but we have to really take a very serious uh, cut at what 
investments are going to create the America of the future, right? We have this mass of kids. We have a third of kids uh, living at, the, at, 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 a, at a very reduced uh, income and opportunity. So the question is, what do we do? What do we do about that? Because those are the kids. All of our kids are going to, are going to be uh, us tomorrow. So uh, Aaron Vorkin, CEO of the National Summer Learning Association, Glenda Bernhardt, CEO of the Freedom School Partners in North Carolina, and Randy Barr, founder and CEO of thinktogether.org in California. Thank you so much for your insights. Attendees, thank you for your prompts. And uh, really, everybody stay safe. And on next Tuesday, we're going to be talking about community foundations because we know that your community foundations locally are funding your various local programs, uh, Randy. Uh, yours, uh, uh, Glenda, and, and Aaron, community foundations are so impactful on your networks. We're going to delve into some of those funding streams uh, on Tuesday. So uh, please attend. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Thank you.